Welcome to the Library of the Royal College of Physicians for this year's Richard Dimbleby Lecture. Tonight, it asks a question that all of us must now face, how to die well. As we come to terms with an increasingly ageing population, many of whom will be suffering from long-term incurable illness, it's become an issue that can't be ignored. This year, we have with us for this lecture Sir Terry Pratchett, the first novelist to give the Richard Dimbleby Lecture, a hugely successful writer who, to the envy of many other writers, has sold over 65 million books, which have been translated into 37 languages. He received a knighthood in 2009 for his services to literature. But perhaps his greatest accolade is that when the BBC had a poll asking the British public to name their favourite novel, there were only two writers who had five books in the top 100. One was Charles Dickens, and the other Yes, was Terry Pratchett. In, in tonight's lecture, which is called Shaking Hands with Death, Sir Terry is going to give his account of why he believes we should be allowed to choose how and when we end our lives. He refers to this as assisted death. For him, it's not an academic debate. In 2007, he was diagnosed with a very rare form of early-onset Alzheimer's disease. At the time, he boldly declared Alzheimer's would be sorry that it got him, and he fought back by donating a million dollars to find research into dementia. Um, before I welcome Sir Terry, I must explain just one thing, though. Tonight, he has an understudy here. One of the side effects of his type of Alzheimer's is that Sir Terry can find it difficult to read, a struggle to read. So at his own request, he has what he describes as a stunt Pratchett, <laughs> who's going to read the speech on his behalf. And he suggested his great friend and colleague, the actor Tony Robinson, forever baldric to you and me, <laughs> who's made his own compelling documentary on the subject of dementia and is an ambassador for the Alzheimer's Society. So it's going to be Tony Robinson who reads the body of the speech. But first, to give his introduction to his Richard Dimbleby lecture, please welcome Sir Terry Pratchett. Thank you very much, David, and thank you all. Firstly, I must express my gratitude and grateful thanks to the Dimbleby family for asking me to give this lecture today. I cherish what I suspect was their reason, or at least part of their reason, for inviting me. When I was a very young newspaper journalist learning my trade, we used to report in our newspaper that people had died of a long illness. Everybody knew what it meant, but no one spoke its name out loud. And then when Richard Dimbleby died of cancer in 1965, his family said that he had in fact died of cancer. And this shocked the nation that a Dimbleby was mortal, and that they had actually used the forbidden word. And somehow I felt that was a marvellous thing, because it seemed to me that the war on cancer developed momentum right at that time. Before you can kill the monster, I always say, you have to be prepared to say its name. It was an echo of that distant example that prompted me to stand up two years ago and announce that I had a form of Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's has been hidden in darkness. And the Dimbleby family's decision to be open about Richard's death was at the soul and centre of my own decision. I wanted there to be determination and a reckoning. My name is Teddy Pratchett. I'm sure you know by now. I've heard myself called 
Mr. Alzheimer's. <laughs> what they're going to be calling me in the morning, I have no idea. <laughs> and I've striven hard to make the world aware of it and what is taking place, I hope, to bring the monster down. And then I realised that there was another taboo. I'm going to talk today about death. But first I have a pleasurable little chore. I may be Mr Alzheimer's, I may be the one that uh, gets in the newspapers, but there are about half a dozen people here who, do, who are ambassadors for the Alzheimer's Society and who have various forms of the disease. And they go around the country and they talk to people and explain to them about it and, as it were, act as a human face because it's when you meet the people that have got it and talk to them that you start to understand. Um, I suppose I get what might be the kudos, but they do a lot of the work. So, gentlemen, ladies, I thank you very much. I would dearly love to have read this aloud, but I know that my friend will do it almost as well as I would. <laughs> and so it is with great pleasure and a certain humble feeling, not too humble, I must pass you over to my voice for tonight, Tony Robinson. When I was a young boy playing on the floor of my grandmother's front room, I glanced up at the television and saw death talking to a knight. And I didn't know very much about death at that point. It was the thing that happened to budgerigars and hamsters. But it was death with a scythe and an amiable manner. I didn't know it at the time, of course, but I just watched a clip from Bergman's Seventh Seal, wherein the knight engages in protracted dialogue and, of course, the famous chess game with the Grim Reaper, who, it seemed to me, didn't seem so terribly grim. The image has remained with me ever since, and death as a character appeared in the very first of my Discworld novels. He's evolved in the series to be one of its most popular characters. Implacable, because that's his job. He nevertheless appears to have some sneaking regard and compassion for a race of creatures which are to him as ephemeral as mayflies, but which nevertheless spend their brief lives making rules for the universe and counting the stars. He is, in short, a kindly death cleaning up the mess that this life leaves and opening the gate to the next one. Indeed, in some religions, he is an angel. People have written to me about him from convents, ecclesiastical palaces, funeral parlours and, not least, hospices. The letters I've had from people all around the world have sometimes made me give up writing for the day and take a long walk. It's touching and possibly worrying that people will write with some difficulty a six-page letter to an author they've never met and include in it sentiments that I very much doubt they'd share with their doctor. I've no clear recollection of the death of my grandparents, but my paternal grandfather died in the ambulance on the way to hospital after just having cooked and eaten his own dinner at the age of 96. It turned out, when we found his birth certificate, that he was really 94. <laughs> but he was proud of being 96, so I hope that no celestial being was kind enough to disillusion him. <laughs> He'd felt very odd, got a neighbour to ring for the doctor, and stepped tidily into the ambulance and out of the world. He died on the way to hospital. A good death, if ever there was one. Except that, according to my father, he did complain to the ambulance men that he hadn't had time to finish his pudding. <laughs> I'm not at all sure about the truth of this, because my father 
had a finely tuned sense of humour which he was good enough to bequeath to me, presumably to make up for the weak bladder, the short stature and the male <laughs> pattern baldness which regrettably came with the package. <laughs> My father's own death was more protracted. He had a year's warning. It was pancreatic cancer. Technology kept him alive, at home, and in a state of reasonable comfort and cheerfulness for that year, during which we had those conversations that you have with a dying parent. Perhaps it is when you truly get to know them, when you realise that it is now you marching towards the sound of the guns, and you're ready to listen to the advice and reminiscences that life was too crowded for up to that point. He unloaded all the anecdotes that I'd heard before about his time in India during the war and came up with a few more that I had never heard. As with so many men of his generation, his wartime service was never far from his recollection. Then at one point he suddenly looked up and said, I can feel the sun of India on my face. And his face did light up rather magically, brighter and happier than I'd seen it at any time in the previous year. And if there'd been any justice or even narrative sensibility in the universe, he would have died there and then, <laughs> shading his eyes from the son of Karachi. He did not. On the day he was diagnosed, my father told me, and I quote, if you ever see me in a hospital bed full of tubes and pipes and no good to anybody, tell them to switch me off. In fact, it took something under a fortnight in the hospice for him to die as a kind of collateral damage in the war between his cancer and the morphine. And in that time, he stopped being him and started becoming a corpse, albeit one that moved ever so slightly from time to time. There wasn't much I could have done, and since the nurses in the Welsh hospice were fine big girls, perhaps that was just as well. I thank them now for the geriatric cat that was allowed to roam the wards and kept me and my mother company as we awaited the outcome. Feline though it was, and also slightly smelly with a tendency to grumble, it was a touch of humanity in the long reaches of the night. On the way back home after my father's death, I scraped my jag along a stone wall in Hayon Wai. To be fair, it's almost impossible not to scrape jags <laughs> along the walls in Hayon Wai, even if your eyes aren't clouded with tears. But what I didn't know at the time, but what I strongly suspect now, was that also playing a part in that little accident was my own disease, subtly making its presence felt. Alzheimer's creeps up very gently, over a long period of time, possibly decades. And baby boomers like myself know that we are never going to die. So always have an explanation ready for life's little hiccups. We say, I've had a senior moment, ha <laughs> ha. We say, everybody loses their car keys. We say, oh, I do that too. I often go upstairs and forget well what I've come up for. We say, I often forget someone's name mid-sentence. And thus, we are complicit in one another's determination not to be mortal. We like to believe that if all of us are growing old, none of us are growing old. I've touch typed since I was 13, but now that was going wrong. I got new spectacles, I bought a better keyboard, not such a bad idea since the old ones was full of beard hairs and coffee. <laughs> and finally, at the end of self-delusion, I went to see my GP. Slightly apologetically, she gave me the standard Alzheimer's test with such taxing questions as what day of the week is it? Me off locally for a scan. The result? I didn't have Alzheimer's. My condition was simply wear and tear on the brain caused by the passage of time that happens to everybody. Old age, in short. I thought, well, I've never been 59 before, so this must be how it is. So off I went reassured about my business. I did a signing tour in Russia, a signing tour in the USA, which included breakfast at the White House. There were lots of other people there. It wasn't as if I handed Mrs Bush the cornflakes or anything. <laughs> <laughs> and then I did a signing tour in Italy, where the wife of our ambassador very diplomatically pointed out that I'd made a fist of buttoning up my shirt. Well, I had got up early for the flight and had dressed in the dark, and so we all had a little chuckle, followed by lunch, and I hoped that everyone but me forgot about it. 
Back home, my typing now was so full of mistakes that it was simpler for me to dictate to my personal assistant. I went to see my GP again, and she sent me to Addenbrooke's Hospital in Cambridge. I've never discussed the interview with her, but either by luck or prescience, I ended up in front of Dr Peter Nestor, one of the few specialists in the country, or maybe the world, who would recognise posterior cortical atrophy, the rare variant of my disease. He and his colleagues put me through a battery of tests and he looked again at my scans, this time, importantly, in a different place. When he gave me the news that I had a rare form of Alzheimer's disease, I quite genuinely saw him outlined in a rectangle of flaming red lines. We had a little bit of a discussion and then, because the facility was closing for the day, I went home, passing another doctor putting on his bicycle clips. This was Cambridge, after all. <laughs> and such was my state of mind that he too was outlined in red fire. The whole world had changed. I was lucky in several ways. PCA is sufficiently different from classic Alzheimer's that I've met fellow sufferers from it who dislike it being linked with that disease, even though the pathology and the end game are ultimately the same. The journey, however, is different. PCA manifests itself through sight problems and difficulty with topological tasks, such as buttoning up a shirt. I have the opposite of a superpower. Sometimes I cannot see what is there. I see the teacup with my eyes, but my brain refuses to send me the teacup message. It's very zen. First, there is no teacup, and then because I know there is a teacup, the teacup will appear the next time I look. I have little workarounds to deal with this sort of thing. People with PCA live in a world of workarounds. A glass revolving door is a potential Waterloo. I also have a workaround for that now, too. In short, if you didn't know there was anything wrong with me, you wouldn't know that there's anything wrong with me. People who have spoken to me for half an hour or so ask me if I'm sure I have the illness. Yes, it's certainly there, but cunning and subterfuge get me through. So does money. The first draft of this speech was dictated using talking point on my computer, which, while not perfect, produces a result that's marvellously better than anything I could tap out on the keyboard. From the inside, the disease makes me believe that I'm constantly being followed by an invisible moron who moves things, steals things, <laughs> hides things that I've put down a second before, and, in general, sometimes causes me to yell with frustration. You see... The disease moves slowly, but you know it's there. Imagine that you're in a very, very slow-motion car crash. Nothing much seems to be happening. There's an occasional little bang, a crunch, a screw pops out and spins across the dashboard as if we were in Apollo 13. But the radio's still playing, the heater's on, and it doesn't seem at all that bad except for the certain knowledge that sooner or later you will definitely be going headfirst through the windscreen. My first call when I got back from Cambridge was to my GP. I wanted to know what was going to happen next. In fact, it became clear that nothing at all was going to happen next unless we made it happen. There was no specialist anywhere local to me prepared to take on an early onset patient with PCA and therefore nobody who could legitimately write me a prescription for the only palliative Alzheimer's drug on the market. When I learned this, I was filled with a rage. A rage that is with me still, but by now tempered and harnessed to practical purposes. I felt alone. A cancer sufferer just diagnosed can at least have some map showing the way the future might hopefully go, and I don't seem, seek to minimise how dreadful that disease would be. But there would be appointments, there would be specialists, there would be tests. Hopefully you would receive sympathy, and hopefully you would have hope. But at that time, the Alzheimer's patient was more or less told to go home. Indeed, I've been contacted by patients who were, in effect, told just that, with not even the suggestion that they might talk to, for example, the Alzheimer's Society. I will say, uh, on another aside, I'm not the sort of person who goes to groups, but much later I was persuaded to go to a PCA meeting in London, 
hosted by Professor Rosser of the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery. I remember the smiles when I started talking about the symptoms, and it was hugely refreshing to be among people who understood without having to be told. But I had seen the bicycle clips of fire. I would have thrown a brick through a pharmacy window late at night for the medication I needed, and come to think of it, that might have been a damn good photo opportunity. <laughs> but friends and contacts of mine who cared about my liberty helped me deal with the situation in the way that people deal with such situations in stupid, hidebound bureaucracies. We bent things just a tiny little bit. It wasn't as though it was stealing. I still had to pay for the damn drugs. But then it was time to decide who I was going to tell. And for the reasons given earlier, I decided to tell everybody. After that, my life ceased to be my own. I've had so much mail that not all of it can be answered in my lifetime. And I can't remember how many interviews I've given. They must run into three figures easily. We did the BAFTA award-winning documentary in which I demonstrated to the world the impossibility of my tying a tie. Funnily enough, I can tie my shoelaces, presumably because I've known how to do that for much longer. I've also been able to write two more books, which my PA insists I tell you were bestsellers. <laughs> Had a stone bridge built over the stream in my garden. Have been kissed by Joanna Lumley. <laughs> <laughs> and after being astonishingly knighted, subsequently made, with the help of knowledgeable friends, a sword, doing it the hard way by first digging the iron ore out of the ground and smelting it in the garden. Of course, I shall never be able to take it out on the street, because such is the decay of our society that not even knights can carry their swords in public. <laughs> Who could ask for anything more, except for maybe another kiss from Joanna Lumley? <laughs> but most of all, in the last couple of years, I've been listening. As a journalist, I learned to listen. It's amazing how much people will tell you if you listen in the right way. Rob, my PA, says that I can listen like a vacuum cleaner. <laughs> Always beware of somebody who's a really good listener. I've heard it said that some people feel that they are being avoided once the news gets around that they have Alzheimer's. For me, it's been just the reverse. People want to talk to me on city streets, in theatre queues, on aeroplanes over the Atlantic, even on country walks. They want to tell me about their mother, their husband, their grandmother. Sometimes it's clear to me that they're extremely frightened and increasingly they want to talk about what I prefer to call assisted death but which is still called, wrongly in my opinion, assisted suicide. I'll digress slightly at this point to talk about the baggage those words carry. Let's start with suicide. As a pallid and nervous young journalist, I got to know about suicide. Oh, didn't I just? It was part of my regular tasks to sit in the coroner's court where I learned all the manifold ways the disturbed human brain can devise to die. High bridges and trains were, I suspect, the most traumatic instruments for all concerned, especially those who had to deal with the aftermath. Newspapers were a little more kindly in those days, and we tended not to go into too much detail, but I had to listen to it. And I remember that coroners never used the word insanity. They preferred the more compassionate verdict that the subject had taken his life while the balance of his mind was disturbed. There was ambivalence to the phrase, a suggestion of the winds of fate and overwhelming circumstance. No need to go into the horrible details that the coroner's officer, always a policeman, mentioned to me after the case. In fact, by now, I've reached the conclusion that a person may make a decision to die because the balance of their mind is level, realistic, pragmatic, stoic and sharp. And that is why I dislike the term assisted suicide applied 
to the carefully thought out and weighed up process of having one's life ended by gentle medical means. The people who thus far have made the harrowing trip to Dignitas in Switzerland to die seem to me to be very firm and methodical of purpose, with a clear prima facie case for wanting their death to be on their own terms. In short, their mind may well be in better balance than the world around them. I'll return again to my father's request to me that I was unable to fulfil. In the course of the past year or so, I've talked amiably about the issues of assisted dying to people of all sorts because they have broached the subject. A lot of them get nervy about the term assisted death and seriously nervy about assisted suicide. But when I mention my father's mantra about not wishing to go on living supported by the pipes and tubes, they brighten up and say, oh yes, I don't have any problem with that. That was the problem reduced from a sterile title into the wishes of a real person in whom perhaps they could see themselves. When I began to draft this speech, the so-called debate on assisted dying was like a snowball fight in the dark. Now it seems to be occupying so much space in the media that I wonder whether uh, something's in the air, an idea whose time is really coming. Very recently, an impassioned outburst by Martin Amis in an interview he gave to the Sunday Times called for euthanasia booths on every street corner. I firmly believe it was there to trap the heart of irony, and I note that it has done so. He was, after all, a novelist talking about a new book. <laughs> did it get publicity? It surely did. Apart from being tasteless, the idea is impractical especially if there happens to be a photo booth next door. <laughs> <laughs> but his anger and grief at the way elderly relatives, friends and colleagues have died is clearly genuine and shared by a great many. The post-war generation has seen what happened to their elders and are determined that it shouldn't happen to them. Even more recently, the British Social Attitudes Survey found that 71% of religious people and 92% of non-religious people were in favour of medically assisted dying for patients with incurable illnesses, if they should so request it. Insofar as there are sides in this debate, they tend to polarise around the Dignity in Dying organisation, who favour assisted death in special circumstances, while others support the Care Not Killing Alliance, whose position, in a nutshell, appears to be that care will cope. And once again, I remember my father. He didn't want to die a curious kind of living death. He wasn't that kind of person. He wanted to say goodbye to me. And knowing him, he would probably have finished with a joke of some kind. And if the nurses had put the relevant syringe in the cannula, I would have pressed it and felt it was my duty. There would have been tears, of course there would. Tears would be appropriate and unsuppressible. But of course this did not happen because myself, my father and the nurses were locked in the aspect of the law. But he actually had a good death in the arms of morphia and I envy him. I got involved in the debate surrounding assisted death by accident after taking a long and, yes, informed look at my future as someone with Alzheimer's and subsequently writing an article about my conclusions. As a result of my coming out about the disease, I now have contacts in medical research industries all over the world and I have no reason to believe that a cure is imminent. I do think, on their good advice, that there may be some very interesting developments in the next couple of years, and I'm not the only one to hope for some kind of stepping stone, a treatment that will keep me going long enough for a better treatment to be developed. I said earlier that PCA at the end game is effectively the same as Alzheimer's, and that it's the most feared disease among the elderly. And although I was diagnosed when I was 59, it has struck adults in their 30s. I enjoy my life and wish to continue it for as long as I'm still myself, knowing who I am and recognising my nearest and dearest. But I know enough about the end game to be fearful of it, despite the fact that as a wealthy man I could probably shield myself from the worst. But even the wealthy, whatever they may do, 
have their appointment in Samara. For younger members of the audience, I should say that the fable appointment in Samara is probably one of the oldest stories in the world and has been recast many times. And its central point is that you can run and you can hide, but every man has his inevitable appointment with death. It's worth a Google. <laughs> Back in my early reporting days, I was told something that surprised me at the time. Nobody has to do what the doctor tells them. <laughs> I learned this when Chief Reporter George Topley slung my copy back at me and said, never say that a patient has been released from hospital unless you're talking about someone who is being detained on mental grounds. The proper word is discharged. And even though the staff would like you to believe that you just can't walk out until they say so, you damn well can. Although, generally speaking, it's best not to be dragging a portable life support system down the steps <laughs> with you. George was a remarkable journalist who, as a fiery young man, would have fought fascism in the Spanish Civil War, were it not for the fact that he stowed away on the wrong boat and ended up in Hull. <laughs> And I remember what George said and vowed that rather than let Alzheimer's take me, I would take it. I would live my life as ever to the full and die before the disease mounted its last attack in my own home, in a chair on the lawn, with a brandy in my hand to wash down whatever modern version of the Brompton cocktail, a potent mixture of painkillers and brandy some helpful medic could supply. And with Thomas Tallis on my iPod, I would shake hands with death. Uh -oh. yeah. I've made my position publicly clear. This seems to me quite a reasonable and sensible decision for someone with a serious, incurable and debilitating disease to elect for a medically assisted death by appointment. These days, non-traumatic death, not the best word, but you'll know what I mean, which is to say deaths that don't, for example, involve several cars, a tanker and a patch of ice on the M4, <laughs> largely take place in hospitals and hospices. Not so long ago, it took place in your own bed. The Victorians knew how to die. They saw a lot of death. And Victorian and Edwardian London were awash with what we would call recreational drugs, which were seen as a boon and a blessing to all. Departing on schedule with the help of a friendly doctor was quite usual, and there's every reason to believe that the medical profession considered that part of its duty, that part of its duty was to help the stricken patient on their way. Does that still apply? It would seem so. Did the Victorians fear death? As death says in one of my own books, most men don't fear death. They fear those things, the knife, the shipwreck, the illness, the bomb, which proceed by microseconds if you're lucky and many years if you're not, the moment of death. And this brings us into the whole care or killing argument. The care not killing alliance, as they phrase it, assures us that no one need consider a voluntary death of any sort since care is always available. This is questionable. Medicine is keeping more and more people alive, all requiring more and more care. Alzheimer's and other dementias place a huge care burden on the country, a burden which falls initially on the next of kin, who may even be elderly, and indeed be in need of some sort of care themselves. The number is climbing as the baby boomers get older, but in addition, the percentage of cases of dementia among the population is also growing. We then have to consider the quality of whatever care there may be, not just for dementia, but for all long-term conditions. I won't go into the horror stories, this isn't the place. And maybe I should leave the field open to Sir Michael Parkinson, who, as the government's dignity ambassador, describes incidents that are, and I quote, absolutely balmy and cruel beyond belief, and care homes as little more than waiting rooms for death. It appears that care is a lottery, and there are those of us who don't wish to be cared for, 
who don't want to spend their time in anyone's waiting room, to have the right not to do what you're told by a nurse, not to obey the doctor. A right, in my case, to demand here and now the power of attorney over the fate of the Terry Pratchett that at some future date I will become. People exercise themselves when they wonder what their nearest and dearest would really want. Well, my nearest and dearest know, and now so do you. A major objection frequently flourished by opponents of assisted dying is that elderly people might be illegally persuaded into asking for assisted death. Could be. But the Journal of Medical Ethics reported in 2007 that there was no evidence of the abuse of vulnerable patients in Oregon, where assisted dying is currently legal. I don't see why things should be any different here. I'm sure nobody considers dying flippantly. The idea that people would persuade themselves to die just because some hypothetical Acme one-stop death shop has opened down the road is fantastical. But I can easily envisage that a person, elderly or otherwise, weighed down with medical problems and understandably fearful of the future and dreading what is hopefully called care may consider the Victorian-style death, gently assisted by a medical professional at home. That might be a more dignified way to go. Last year, the government finally published guidelines on dealing with assisted death. They didn't appear to satisfy anybody. It seems that those wishing to assist a friend or relative to die would have to meet quite a large number of criteria in order to escape the chance of prosecution for murder. We should be thankful that some possibility that they might not be prosecuted is in theory possible, but as laid out, the best anyone could do is keep within the rules and hope for the best. That's why I and others have suggested some kind of strictly non-aggressive tribunal that would establish the facts of the case well before the assisted death takes place. This might make some people, including me, a little uneasy as it suggests the government has the power to tell you whether you can live or die. But that said, the government cannot sidestep the responsibility to ensure the protection of the vulnerable and we must respect that. It grieves me that those against assisted death seem to assume as a matter of course that those of us who support it have not thought long and hard about this very issue and know that it's of fundamental importance. It is, in fact, at the soul and centre of my argument. The members of the tribunal would be acting for the good of society as well as of that of the applicant, horrible word, and ensure that they are of sound and informed mind, firm in their purpose, suffering from a life-threatening and incurable disease and not under the influence of a third party. It would need wiser heads than mine, though heaven knows that they should be easy enough to find, to determine how such tribunals are constituted. But I would suggest there should be a lawyer one with expertise in dynastic family affairs, who has become good at recognising what somebody really means, and indeed, if there is outside pressure, and a medical practitioner experienced in dealing with the complexities of serious long-term illnesses. Those opposing assisted death say that the vulnerable must be protected as if that would not have occurred to anyone else. As a matter of fact, there is no evidence, and evidence has been sought, that anywhere in the world where assisted dying is practised, the sick or elderly are being cajoled into assisted death by relatives. And I see no reason to believe why that would be the case here. Doctors tell me that, to the contrary, family members more often beg them to keep Granny alive even when Granny is indeed, by all medical standards, at the end of her natural life. Importantly, the tribunal would also serve to prevent, as much as humanly possible, any abuses. I would also suggest that all those on the tribunal are over 45 years old by which time they may have acquired the rare gift of wisdom, because wisdom and compassion should, in this tribunal, stand side by side with the law. 
The tribunal would also have to be a check on those seeking death for reasons that reasonable people may consider trivial or transient distress. I dare say that quite a few people have contemplated death for reasons that much later seem to them to be quite minor. If we are to live in a world where a socially acceptable early death can be allowed, it must be allowed as a result of careful consideration. Let us consider me as a test case. As I've said, I would like to die peacefully with Thomas Tallis on my iPod before the disease takes me over. And I hope that will not be for quite some time to come, because if I knew that I could die at any time I wanted, then suddenly every day would be as precious as a million pounds. If I knew that I could die, I would live. My life, my death, my choice. There has been no evidence in those areas where assisted dying is currently practised that it leads to any kind of slippery slope. It seems to be an item of faith among those opposed to assisted dying that it will open the door to abuses all the way up to the culling of the elderly sick. This is a nightmare and only a nightmare. This cannot be envisaged in any democracy unless we find ourselves under a tyranny. That is to say, a tyranny that is far more aggressive than the mild one currently operated by the Health and Safety Inspectorate. <laughs> <laughs> Frankly, that objection is a bogeyman. It's been suggested that people wouldn't trust their doctor if they knew that they had the power to kill them. Why should this be? A doctor has an awful lot to lose by killing a patient. Indeed, it seems to me that asking a medical practitioner who is fully aware of your situation to bring your life to an end is placing the utmost trust in them. The saying, thou shalt not kill, but needst not strive officiously to keep alive, has never been formal advice to the medical profession. Given that it was made up by Arthur Hugh Clough, who was in a similar profession to me, that is not surprising. <laughs> but ever since the birth of medicine, doctors have understood its meaning. They have striven. Oh, how they have striven. In the past two centuries, we have improved the length of our lives and the quality of said lives to the point where we feel somewhat uneasy if anyone dies as early as the biblical age of 70. But there comes a time when technology outpaces sense, when we believe a blip on an oscilloscope is confused with life and that humanity unravels into a state of mere existence. Observation, conversation and some careful deduction lead me to believe that the majority of doctors who support the right to die are those who are most closely involved day to day with patients, while support appears to tail off as you reach those heights where politics and medicine merge. It would be interesting to speculate how many doctors would come out were it not for the baleful glare of the BMA. Anyone who has any long-term friendships, acquaintances or professional dealings within the medical profession, let alone knows anything about the social history of medicine, knows that down the ages it has seen it as part of its duty to allow those beyond hope and skill to depart in peace. I can recall the metaphors that have been used, helping them over the step, showing them the way, helping them find the door pointing them to heaven, but never ever killing them because in their minds they were not killing and in their minds they were right. In fact, I've not found any reputable information from those places where assisted death is allowed that shows any deleterious effect on the community. I certainly do not expect or assume that every GP or hospital practitioner would be prepared to assist death by arrangement, even in the face of overwhelming medical evidence. That is their choice. Choice is very important in this matter. But there will be some, probably older, probably wiser, who will understand. 
It seems sensible to me that we should look to the medical profession that over the centuries has helped us to live longer and healthier lives, to help us die peacefully among our loved ones in our own home without a long stay in God's waiting room. And finally, there is the God argument, which I think these days appears to have been subsumed into concern for the innocents that may suffer if assisted dying was allowed. The problem with the God argument is that it only works if you believe in God, more specifically Jehovah, which I do not. Spinoza, Darwin and Carl Sagan have found in my imagination places which God has never found. Therefore... I am a humanist and would rather believe that we are a rising ape, not a falling angel. Nevertheless, I have a sneaking regard for the Church of England and those I disagree with. We should always debate ideas that appear to strike at the centre of our humanity. Ideas and proposals should be tested. I believe that consensual assisted death for those that ask for it is quite hard to oppose, especially by those that have some compassion. But we do need in this world people to remind us that we are all human and that humanity is precious. It's that much heralded thing, the quality of life, that's important. How you live your life, what you get out of it, what you put into it, and what you leave behind after it. We should aim for a good and rich life well lived. And at the end of it, in the comfort of our own home, in the company of those who love us, have a death worth dying for. Ladies and gentlemen, Sir Terry Pratchett. Thank you. Thank you.